This is Vanessa Marshall, voice of Black Canary, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 12 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and I am here with my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, easter eggs, and comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Please! I lost one, Mom! I can't lose you, too! Okay, Patrol! Spell it out! T-I-E-T-I-E-T-I-E Let's die! Yeah! We're not gonna make it! And with that emotional roller coaster, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan. The title for this week's episode is Nightmare Monkeys. The release date was January 25th of 2019. The in-episode date was October 15th, because this takes place on the same day as the previous episode, Another Freak. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Vinton Huke. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits. Uh, we get Greg Sipes. Uh, coming in for a whole Garfield episode. Greg Griffin returns as Helga Jace. Scott Menville does Steve Dayton, <laughs> a.k.a. Mento, uh, and The Chief. C- uh, Curry Payton as Jefferson Pierce and Robot Man. Kevin Michael Richardson as Tom Bender, Paul Sloan, and the Clamulon Commander. <laughs> very important. He's a very important character, Rich. He is. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Uh, Deborah Strang as uh, Gretchen Good. Tara Strong comes in as Negative Woman and Casey Brink, who is the EMT uh, that gets thrown out of the room. And Hayden Walk as Perdita and Elastigirl and Rita Farr. I love it. Yep. Let's get on to the mission. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens with Garfield Logan, formerly known as Beast Boy, filming an episode of Space Trek 3016, the sci-fi TV series that he stars in nowadays since leaving his superhero career behind, as far as we know. After the credits, we then see him talking with Gretchen Good, the head of Good World Studios. From that, we get a quick exposition backfill of information about Gar's history in the entertainment industry. He's now acting alongside Paul Sloan, who played Connor back on Hello, Megan, and who happens to also be his godfather. Rita Farr was apparently his godmother before her death, and Steve Stephen Dayton is his new legal guardian and manager. It's a lot of information to take in. We're condensing things. <laughs> yeah. Oy. After all that... <laughs> We cut over to Happy Harbor, where the whole Outsiders team is getting filled in on what happened during Halo and Forager's first day of school. They're all introduced to Vic Stone, and it's finally revealed that Halo is, in fact, a mother box. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Which you all knew every episode. We've talked about it in our Crash in the Mode. The group pulls all the pieces from this season together and realize that Halo is basically the soul of the murdered and disassembled mother box that Connor found back in the Bedlam facility, combined with the body of Gabrielle Dow, who died during the Medellin awakening process. It's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot in these last few episodes. It's a lot. But it's just, it just, it's all a lot. But everyone basically accepts this new level of weirdness without much trouble, a little bit of trouble. Everyone, everyone accepts that Halo's a mother box and just goes, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> There's enough trouble that <laughs> the father box starts attacking people. Well, We'll get to it. (laughs) Because after all that, we then cut over to the Luther Grand Hotel in Beverly Hills, where Garfield is meeting up with Queen Perdita for their date. Because, you know. It's adorable. (laughs) They're real cute. 
Uh, in her hotel room, he tries on a pair of good goggles that she recently received as a gift, and it's it's totally fine. Nothing nothing is wrong until the goggles take a quick sample of his blood and start glowing red. Nothing bad will happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because we then cut back over to Happy Harbor, where the group is trying to make sense of Victor Stone's situation. While Halo tries to explain what she did to help him, Sphere tries to attack Victor, Victor gets possessed again and tries to fight back, and Connor has to jump in the middle of things and stop them both because he's the only indestructible adult in the room. And he loses another shirt. Just infinite supply of this one shirt. So many shirts. (laughs) Well, it's general chaos. It's general chaos until everyone realizes that Vic's cybernetics are the result of a father box, and Halo is the only one who can temporarily cleanse him. Jefferson suggests returning Vic to his father. Vic refuses, and Connor and McGann resign themselves to adopting yet another moody teenager with superpowers. At least this one's 18. Uh, Back in Beverly Hills, Garfield's still playing around with the good goggles until they start mind-controlling him, brainwashing him, and send him to Encino. For some reason. However, the goggles short out and Gar starts hallucinating, picturing himself aboard the starship Engager from Space Trek 3016, surrounded by holograms of Wally West, Ted Cord, Jason Todd, and Tula, all the heroes that we have seen die over the series or have seen holograms of Ted. Understood we're dead. (laughs) Understood we're dead. Definitely. We then cut back to Happy Harbor again, where McGann and Connor have a quick heart-to-heart about how superheroics have been intruding on their normal lives, and I am happy, Uh, but they can't seem to come to an agreement about how to fix that. Yeah. (laughs) I like like my kids talking. (laughs) Yep. And back in Garfield's hallucination, the Clamulons are attacking the ship and killing the other heroes until it's just Wally and Garfield left. However, before we can really start crying over Wally's death yet again, Gar gets distracted by Monkey, his childhood pet monkey from season one, and chases after him all the way into another animation style. (laughs) But back in the physical plane of Beverly Hills, Queen Perdita is freaking out and trying to wake Gar up from what appears to be a very strange unconscious state. He's in trouble. Boy's in trouble. (laughs) We then cut back to Gar's mind, which currently exists in a Teen Titans Go parody homage callback thingy called Doom Patrol Go. Here we learn that Gar was adopted by Rita Farr after his mother's death and joined her as part of the Doom Patrol. However, the Doom Patrol's got to do what the Doom Patrol always does, which is go off and die on a mission. (laughs) But once that happens, Gar went to live with Miss Martian, which we saw in season two. Uh, But apparently somewhere between seasons two and three, Steve Dayton, who is Rita Farr's husband and uh, adopted father, sort of resurfaces and claims parental rights to Garfield, taking him away from again because he's a jerk. And it's all just a very weird and heartbreaking cartoon fever dream. The whole episode. Welcome to the whole episode. Yep. The emotional roller coaster is intense. Yep. We then cut back to Beverly Hills again, where Connor and McGann have arrived to help save Garfield from whatever's going on. Apparently, Garfield's trapped in a psychic fugue state, and McGann has to telepathically link with him to try and lead him back out safely. And back inside Garfield's mind, he's now trapped in a Hello Megan themed hallucination where he gets to see his mom again until Queen Bee interrupts and Gar relives the memory of watching his mother's death under Queen Bee's mind control. A vision so traumatic that Garfield begs for it to just stop, which results in his heartbeat stopping in the real world. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But we're not done yet. Inside Garfield's mind, we get a new explanation for why he has the powers that he has. Apparently, it wasn't just McGann's blood transfusion that resulted in his penna powers. He was also chosen by a magical monkey god 
explaining why Gar can only turn into animals and doesn't have to follow the laws of physics, like conservation of mass. And that monkey god was the one who apparently shorted out the good goggles to keep Gar from being brainwashed permanently. While Garfield's trying to process all of that, McGann arrives to quote-unquote save him, but he's already figured out how to save himself. He's also made a decision to return to the superhero life, and after waking up in the real world, Garfield explains to McGann and Connor that Gretchen Good must be one of the bad guys because she has her hands in everything, and the good goggles are not good. Who would have guessed? However, a full explanation will have to wait until next episode because Garfield's got to go kiss his girlfriend. Uh, (laughs) McGann resigns herself to the fact that teaming up to save her adopted brother from a coma is the closest thing she's going to get to date night with Connor for a while, and they kiss. And all the way back in Happy Harbor, we cut to seeing Brion and Violet kiss for the first time. That's how we wrap up this fever dream of an episode. (laughs) (laughs) We say fever dream affectionately. We both really enjoy this episode. It's just so much. Oh no. No, it's a fever dream and I love I love every minute of it. <laughs> let's ask let's go it's master. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Oh my gosh. Where do we even start? There's- there's so many levels of I, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest. Like I I've rewatched this episode multiple times this week with the intention of writing notes and I just get lost in it. This is one of the f- first episodes that I have I can't write notes because I can't it, the way that it's structured is so beautifully done in this surreal dreamlike state that I I'm carried on to another emotional state like just the just the moment where uh, he goes into the Doom Patrol Go thing. I think it's right after that. The Perdi- cuts to Perdita. Yeah. And so you're like, what is happening? And you're kind of laughing a little bit because like an elephant never forgets. And he starts into that that bit. And then it cuts to Perdita freaking out and taking the good goggles off of him. And he collapses to the ground. And I'm just like, I don't know which one of six emotions I'm supposed to be feeling right now. And it's flipping so quickly back and forth. It feels so much like that dream logic in but yet makes sense literally like i've i've talked about it before the first time i watched this episode and there was the doom patrol go song my my brain like stopped working for the entirety of that song because i was Uh like laugh crying and just holding my head in my hands trying to process what was happening because i'm like this is hilarious but also i am in pain yeah (laughs) Like, my roommate literally asked me at one point, she's like, are you okay? Because I'm sitting there with headphones in, like, laugh crying at nothing. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't know yeah. what's wrong. But, <laughs> and that's kind of this whole episode. So the first time that, that Neil and I watched this was together at the DC Universe recording studios. Yeah. And so, because we watched four episodes in a row, back to back, and then went on the DC Universe to talk about them. And they were like, okay, we're going to have you watch these episodes ahead of time because we have you here. They were airing like just a few days later. Yeah. But they had us watch them a little bit early so we could we could talk about them while we were there and not have to make a separate trip. And I'm like, these are the four episodes, these last four episodes. We, like, we have 20 minutes to like break these episodes down and go talk about. And after watching that, like we were both... Uh, so I, I'm not sure what the, what even the word would be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like the whole thing of like, sorry, your second mom died or whatever. What was it? What's that quote? <laughs> it's just all, all three of them simultaneously going, sorry, your mom died. And I'm laughing, yeah. but I feel bad that I'm laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how to process this. And there's a line from the song. It was like, just wave goodbye so, to your second mom. That's it. Just wave goodbye. Wave goodbye to your second mom. I'm just like, I can't. <laughs> We're not going to make it. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm laughing like, because there's so much history behind the Doom Patrol too. And I'm like, I'm like, yep. It's like, this is what we do. And I'm like, that's totally true. So there's just so much. And, you know, like I said, like the original Teen Titan show, I wasn't as as much of a, of a fan of now I've gone back and rewatched a bunch of it um, since, and uh, I'm appreciating it in a whole new level than I did before. But 
so I've got that going on, right? It, there's just so, I don't know. I don't know what to say. And there's this deeply, I have to say this deeply spiritual trip he's going on, a thing that he had to have that was horrible and painful and deep to face these things. Just that first line where he's just, he's like, they're like, oh, that single tear thing, that was amazing. And he's like, I've had a lot of practice. That's how it cuts right before into the credit, opening credits. And me knowing his history from the comics, I'm just like, oh, man, that's rough. And then I'm like, oh, confirmation of Doom Patrol. Here we go. Like, uh, wait, and then are we going to have the Doom Oh, wait, no, though. Nope, they're dead. They're all dead. Oh, wait, read. Oh, yep. But oh, both his moms died. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Like, just hammering him. And then we get that scene that we, the confirmation that he was there when the truck went over the cliff. Like, yep. Like it wasn't like from that season two episode where he's there and we see the vision of it coming off the cliff. Like, it's not that he came by later. You know, he watched it happen. And from the comics, in the tie in comics, you can, Queen Beats tells her, you know, Garfield's at the bottom of this cliff. This is the fast way to get to him, you know? And she's like, okay, because she's mind controlled. It's just, it's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sh- I don't even know what to say. But it also has to be this deeply spiritual thing. He needs to go and face these things. He needs to go and look at these things. And it's those things that no one wants to look at, right? You're like, I'm doing the best I can with what I have, but I don't want to go back and revisit these things. But it's not like he's revisiting them. He's processing them. He has to process them. You know, like, who are you? And and he, he like, went on this path of saying, like, well, I want to be close to my mom, and that's all that matters to me right now, so I guess I'll be an actor. But did he really want to do that? And it sounds like he didn't. Or not that he didn't want to do it, but he wanted to do it, but for the wrong reasons. He wanted to follow his mom's dream to be closer to his mom as opposed to really taking ownership of who he is and what he wants to do. And that is a deeply spiritual story, right? coming in to your own and understanding who you are and you're allowed to be your own expression of yourself like that so much. <sighs> All right. This is why I couldn't write notes down. I'm just I see, I all see. over the place with this episode. <laughs> you, want, you want me to dive into some slightly Yeah, why, why don't you stuff? dive into some specifics now that I've done my thing? No judgment. No, dude, I understand there's a lot happening in this this episode. But speaking of Garfield's acting career, I like that we get to see it right off the bat. I like that we get to see what he's been doing. And I like the little like fun jokes and stuff that they throw into that. Like this is this is a heartbreaking emotional episode on a lot of levels. But I like that in the first 30 seconds, we get things like the fact that Beast Boy's character on his show is apparently from Mars, which is just right. a fun little thing, and that he gets to have McGann's I'm not human line, where I'm like, yep. oh, honey, that's fun. And even like the fact that there's, if you listen closely to that whole scene, the Wilhelm scream is in there, <laughs> just because yeah. of course it is. <laughs> One of the Clamulons yep. just has the Wilhelm scream. I'm like, this is good. These are fun interesting little things that they're just fun little easter eggs and then after that we get Mm. the scene with him and gretchen good and paul sloan and stephen dayton and so many characters and so much exposition but it was a scene that made me wonder especially on rewatching it for the millionth time what i think a lot of us have been wondering since season one who who gar's dad is because I've been wondering this for forever on some level, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. But for whatever reason, rewatching this scene and especially seeing like the fact that they call out that like Paul Sloan is not his dad, I'm over here just mm-hmm. being like, okay, wait. But like, who is your dad? <laughs> right. And I, I think it brings up a lot because it they never they never mention him they never right. mention him he, and and even paul sloan says like oh and then you know when your mom took you to the greater bialya yeah you know and it's like okay well his whoever his dad was was out of the picture or Clearly. never ex- never existed in the fir- or never never was in the picture in the first place and even gar processing through all this he's processing the deaths 
and his issues with like his the deaths of his his two mothers and the his issues with mento <laughs> so there there's all these these things that have emotional impact on him but for for whatever reason whoever his father is or you know to be honest like maybe she decided to have him on her own and he just never was in the picture which is a which is a which is a possibility as well and there's a lot of fan speculation about about that as well but one way or the other whoever his father was did not have an emotional impact on him you know yep. there's no need he's no need to process any of that <laughs> he's got to process some other people so apparently that's already been dealt with for him i know it's one of those things where like i don't i don't need it i'm always just curious with well and that's the and that's the thing like it, it it we don't need it because he doesn't need it. Yeah, absolutely. Right, like absolutely. clearly, it's not something that matters to him. There are other things that matter that were were hard enough, you know. Absolutely, yeah. it's just there's so much happening in this episode. Even looking at my notes, I even took notes, and I'm still all over the place. <laughs> I mean, the episode jumps. It it does, and it. There is a surreal quality, and I've used that term in the past, but uh, the surrealness of this and how to present a surreal episode that is surreal but isn't technically by the definition of surreal, but makes enough logical sense and gives us so much information and follows a through line yet somehow does it in... Like you're you're saying, like, oh, he went so far he turned into a new animation style. (laughs) I mean, yep, pretty much. Yeah what happens uh yeah there's a whole thing in my head when i watched that i was like oh look he's putting up a self-defense mechanism he's he's going to comedy which is what beast boy does to process information right yep he's like i don't want to deal with any of all of these people dying i've had enough people die in my life i don't want any of that what do i want oh i want the comfort of monkey and oh i want to go to do something and and be silly and lighthearted and Oh, well, that didn't work either. And then it morphs back into the thing he has to deal with again, even as much as he's trying to defend himself. Oh my gosh, there's so many psychological layers in this episode. (laughs) But even with like going to that scene, jumping to that scene for a second, I love that when he first wakes up in that first hallucination, he's so happy for a second because he gets to see all of his people again. And that's heartbreaking. Because his yeah. first his first reaction is to just smile because like Wally's there and that's a good thing and then he has to watch as all of them get killed again. There's so much happening in this episode and it all hurts. It's interesting to me too because like it made me wonder like so Jason who's the who's the Robin that's in the scene right we've seen his hologram in the um, in the grotto. Jason and Tula both joined the team in that five-year gap between one and two, which means Gar knew them. Yep. Which is interesting. Um, and actually, Tula was on the team on the team during the video game. Yep. And Gar is, an, is a playable character in the video game, too. So he was a po- fully active part of the team when she passed away. I don't know about Jason, because Tim, I think, is a available player in that game yep. as well. But Ted Cord's there. And I'm like, okay, well, he, I know he didn't know Ted, but that's, or did, oh, actually, maybe he did know Ted because he could have been part of the team when Ted died and Jaime came on part of the team, actually. He joined the team before Beetle did. Yeah, interesting. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I was thinking, like, maybe he didn't know Ted, but I guess maybe he did. I'm just like, I'll just let you process. I'll just let you walk I'm through processing. it. I'm processing. This episode, <laughs> subtitled Processing. <laughs> young justice therapy but i'm gonna jump back for a second to stuff yeah, please that is no, we're gonna jump everywhere we're so gonna you just do your so thing. much jumping like i keep trying to think of segues and then i'm like no, no segues no i'm just gonna jump i think it's hilarious this million three watch i realized that another freak and this happened on the exact same day and my that's interesting right and my brain was just like because one's in the afternoon and one's at night and i was just like McGann is having a ridiculously stressful day because she's the she's one who's part of both of these storylines. <laughs> like she's, she's like, I'm going to go to school and have a normal day of work. And then it's like, nope, one of your kids disappeared and has brought back another kid that now you have to look after. Also, your adoptive brother's in a coma. Uh, <laughs> Yikes. 
<laughs> it's so much like my brain had never even watching these back to back the first time my brain did not click that these happened in the same 24 hours <laughs> my brain spaced them out more for no other yeah. reason <laughs> yeah uh, but I do like little things in this episode, like the fact that Artemis gets to have her little Hello Megan moment and showing that that's part of the team lingo now. I like it. What do you, can you, I'm having a hard time pulling that up. What was that? What was this moment? In, when they're, when they're going through, when they're, <laughs> when the team is piecing together the, all of the things that prove that Halo is a mother box, at one uh. point, Artemis just goes, Oh, hello, Megan, of course. Dr. Fate said Halo was a very young soul and a young in a a very old soul in a young body. And like that's her like lead into it. And it's her being like I did not catch her saying that at all. Oh, I gotta go rewatch that. Oh, that's fantastic. See, because it's so much part of just the way that the team talks that you just accepted it as just dialogue. Um yeah. <laughs> is how uh, I'm playing it off. Yeah, but of yeah, course. it um it, I love it. I love that that has fit in the same way that Crash and Whelmed and all of the things have fit into the way that this team talks. It's it's or fun. mode. Yeah. Like at the end, Gar's like, or maybe I'm just feeling the mode. Yeah. You know, or just was yeah, interesting. But yeah. <laughs> Artemis gets to have that moment and it made me laugh because I just That's like great. that. I love the team having their own vocab. I also want to point out that I heckin' love Queen Perdita. So yeah, much. I said this during Scream Something, but I'm bringing it back because Perdita is out here being a teenage queen running her country. Her fashion is on point. She's dating a superhero TV star who's super supportive of her career. Queen Perdita's got it all figured out. She does. <laughs> and they I are, love They're it. super cute, those two together they're, as well. They're so cute. They're really cute, especially since the show has so little time to make us care and believe that relationship and yeah and they do it so well because they just have real cute little little 15 year old banter and we know both of them as individual characters and then you put them together and you're like oh yeah no this works this works this is cute i like it uh they're real sweet but jumping back all of my notes are always like in chronological order which with this episode especially is real weird because it jumps around so much but I realized after our conversation of uh, talking about the last episode, going into way too much detail about where Halo's cleansing powers fall on like her power spectrum, her color light spectrum. Halo goes out of her way in this to say that she didn't heal him and that she knows that she didn't heal him and that it's not part right. of her healing power. So that for me makes me think that the cleansing thing is either part of Indigo or its own separate thing. But I I don't think so because in that last episode, she said like my violet aura doesn't work that way. Like I didn't heal you. My violet aura doesn't work that way. Making making the implication that she had used the violet aura on him and it didn't work that way. And she had to do the verbal thing to reprogram him. That's what I'm thinking. But then this has like a slightly different language in the way that it's explained. Like they don't have her oh, yeah. say that thing again. I don't remember exactly what it was now because I I didn't write the quote down when I should have. But oh, I don't know. Good. I don't know. It's weird. All right. Maybe the More second half of this season <laughs> will explain what is up with this. Halo. How does Halo work? Well, we got a whole bunch of episodes coming real soon. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and just... Connor and McGann are out here wrangling all these gosh darn kids. They they like volunteer to not kick Victor out, and I my brain is immediately like, "Where are you going to keep him? You've run out of space." I don't know. I, and you know what I'm thinking? Snapper coming home from work and just going like, Ugh. <laughs> like they're like multiplying. Like, okay, fine. You adopted one exiled prince. Fine. Sure. Put him in the okay, RV. Also, now, someone an alien? Hovering fine. Over the- <laughs> but you, you found a robot kid. Where'd you even find a robot kid? How do we, how do we have th- three more teenagers than we started out three months ago? Right. right. At least I guess the implication is since Violet is staying with Artemis, that's okay. So we have an, at least another household. They're not all staying in the same place. <laughs> they sent only Halo somewhere else. Right. Again, Snapper, like, just be careful of the trees. That's all I'm asking. That's funny. It's, I love it. And I think it's hilarious. And like, 
there's precedent for this. We've had two seasons of them just adopting strays, but I'm like, we have graduated from, look, we found a weird puppy that has super strength to like, we have, <laughs> here are our three teenage children. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Uh, and But also, speaking of Connor and McGann in this episode, I'll just be over here weeping over them having open and honest communication about the obstacles Absolutely. they're facing in their relationship. Because like, I love it. I've loved this scene forever. And I love it even more on rewatches. Like, they're not quite on the same page. And Wolf is hilarious, hilariously disappointed in their nonsense. Like, Wolf <laughs> just follows after them. And when they don't agree, he just kind of sighs and walks away. And I'm like, your dog is judging you right now. But like, rewatching it, they're really basically both suggesting we need time alone in a space away from our people. They just have different yeah. ideas about how that should work. So I'm like, you're not really on different pages here. You're just, you just need slightly more communication. Yeah. And this isn't, this is a super old trope to this idea of, you know, a couple both being like, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And then they suggest two things, but typically it's taken in this really painful way where they're suggesting two completely different things. And then it's usually the, you know, the husband or whatever that's looked at as the insecure or, or insensitive kind of whatever it drives me crazy. And in this one, I think, I think, cause I was thinking the same thing. I was, Connor was like, you just need another place to put these kids so you can have private time to yourself. And yeah. I think that's what Connor was saying. I think you're right. So they're both kind of saying like, I definitely want to have date night. We're all good with date night. We just got to figure out a solution, you know? So it's it's good. I appreciate it so much. We've been talking about it a lot this season about the way that all of their storyline has just been talking. Talk about your feelings. Talk about your relationship. And right. I'm like, this is right. good. I'm here for it. I'm very happy. Yeah. Building off of that, we get other wonderful stuff with their... I think it's really interesting that we don't see McGann and Connor get that call from Queen Perdita, but I also really like that she can just call them, that she just knows them. I like that i like that it's such it's such a small subtle thing that the show just kind of does the show just presents yeah. and wants you to accept queen perdita knows miss martian and superboy knows that they are both powered individuals knows that they are both related to beast boy they're all a weird little unit and i like it i like that we can just have both of them show up at their door and have her say i called you and 911 and we're just like okay queen perdita just has miss martian's number Sure. Yeah. Which also, which again, does this thing about like creating living worlds, you know, Absolutely. that we were talking about uh, with uh, Lucas. There's this, this idea of um, the, the fact that this exists tells us a lot of stuff in this tiny little scene, which is Garfield and, M M and McGann are very close, right? No matter what's going on, they're always, they're very close. She knows, not only knows that they're dating, they have a close personal relationship and she's supportive of that, and they're supportive of each other. It's just, it's fantastic. Also, it implies that, I mean, obviously Perdita's not surprised when McGann turns green and comes into the room, right? Yeah. But then it does make me think, like, how how much does Perdita know? And Perdita was present at the in the very early episodes, you know, in Markovia. Yep. So I'm, inter I'm interested to know whether or not I don't know. There's a lot of questions. Like you were saying back in the day, like, oh, Perdita's like, oh, my boyfriend's brother-in-law <laughs> soon to be is yeah. saving me right now kind of a thing. And does she have, I, I kept thinking like, does she have like a Beast Boy signal watch when she gets in trouble? <laughs> like, I mean, they're across the world, so you couldn't do much about it, but like, <laughs> you know hilarious. what I mean? <laughs> right. Or does she just be like, no, I'm not going to call my boyfriend. I'm going to call all of my guards from this country right. are going to come and take care of business. She doesn't right? need her boyfriend to save her. She's got, she has she's her probably own got a secret bodyguard service. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> oh, but it's it's cool. And I like I like those connections. And even though the show doesn't like explicitly point out that Connor saves Queen Perdita in those early episodes, like it's there. It's that cool little background connection and we get to see it here. It's very nice. I have a whole like thing going on in my head now about a tv show about queen Berdita's secret service agents and how they have to deal and process with the fact that their queen is dating a superhero who probably is going to have her put in danger all the time and like how do they deal with it <laughs> and she's just like i do 
do you really think I'm in more danger from this than being a political leader? Like, <laughs> and my uncle, <laughs> who's a villain, super villain. Like, right. guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But and when they showed up, uh, when the when McGann and Connor show up this time around, it really clicked in my mind, and I kind of picked up on the fact McGann immediately goes into fierce big sister mode, whereas oh, yeah. Connor, who from early seasons is Mr. Rage Monster, is like this very calm and considerate voice of reason who just kind of shuffles the paramedics out and is like, "We'll return <laughs> well, the gurney later." He picks them up and carries them out, but it's he the does Connor pick them equivalent. Up and physically of... removes them from the room. <laughs> it's the Connor equivalent of calmly shuffling someone out of the room. That's fair. That's fair. And he's like, we'll re- thank you for your service. We'll return the gurney later. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And closes the door. And he does it all very right. calmly. <laughs> Whereas McGann right. is just like, hi, my brother is in trouble, and I'm just going to glow until things are fixed. <laughs> right. Oh, because we've seen we've seen that with her in previous episodes, like dealing with McCom. When McGann goes into big sister mode, McGann goes into big sister mode hard. <laughs> Which then also leads to the quote that I have to point out simply because it's made me cry for months on end. Uh, that is, we talk about it so much in our Scream Somethings. That's just McGann telling Connor, you're my anchor, and him simply responding always, and then they move on, and I cry because <laughs> it's so natural, and it's just a system that they've worked out that keeps her grounded and keeps yep. her from going too far into her powers, and it's not even a question. It's just something they do. It's something that they've both agreed on, and it's just her confirming a thing that she already knows is going to be true, and I cry because it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, it's this thing we keep talking about, this like better way to represent relationships and relationship drama in a show. Yep. I I mean there's there's comedy and that kind of stuff, but there's just there are better ways to do it. Ways to ways to show that yeah, even in healthy relationship relationships aren't either uh working 100% all the time or entirely dysfunctional. Yeah. Right? And there also isn't like the only healthy relationship is yelling at each other, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's kind of what happens all the time or mocking each other or undermining each other like that is not really a good way to have a relationship in my opinion so i i just seeing every little thing that they do in here works for me it's something i want my kids to be able to see yeah i guess this whole season and especially with the two of them the way that the show has gone out of its way to have the romantic relationships that they want you to be rooting for are relationships that are casual in their intimacy is a thing that is so good and I will be talking about it in Super Sweethearts, I promise. I just need to do it. <laughs> um, it's a whole thing to unpack, and we don't have time because there's 10 other things happening in this episode. But yeah, it's good. They're casual in the way that they care about each other, and it makes me so happy. Yeah. We can never unpack everything that's happening in these Gar hallucinations. Do we even want to try? Like, Doom Patrol Go has so many layers to it. Yes. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think, I honestly, I don't think we have enough time. I could do like a whole like episode just on the psycho spiritual and social emotional aspects of everything of his process. Like again, when I maybe have Dr. Letamendi back on and say, let's talk about this episode. <laughs> like, I think we really need like maybe a full discussion episode with a pro. We just to see, might to see what, what is happening in this episode. And it's also one like, I, I don't know. I was just thinking like, I mean, it's so self-contained in many ways. Like you don't need yeah. to know that much about the history of, of Garfield. Cause we don't have that much about the history of Garfield at this point. It pretty much is all self-contained in yeah. a way. Uh, on the less spiritual and psychological end of those scenes, I just want to point out the fun Easter egg stuff that they do. Like they bring in the entire original cast of teen Titans and teen Titans go to voice yep. the doom patrol. Yeah. The fact that, Part of the reason they did this was because Teen Titans Go had a couple of episodes that referenced Young Justice, so they decided to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And the McGann that shows up in that Doom Patrol thing is in that style as well. Yeah, because <laughs> she was one of the Young Justice characters who appeared in Teen Titans Go. Yeah, and it's yep. just it's it's so good. It's so weird. That song will be stuck in my head forever. But getting down to like the last minute 30 seconds of the episode i got some stuff that i that i personally gotta unpack and give a mini canary debrief here let's do it a mini uh super sweethearts (laughs) it's yeah a little bit of both uh first i do want to point out that it is 
peak teen superheroes to have someone go, my boss is one of the bad guys debrief later. I have to go kiss my girlfriend, uh, <laughs> which is hilarious. Like, Gar, there are more important things going on, but g- go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> fine. I love it. The thing that I love a little bit less that I talked recently in a recording with uh, Ariel Horn from Young Justice TV, we talked about this a bit. Oh, yeah. You, you just recorded a discussion with her we're yes. going to have up coming up soon. That's Good. coming up. Uh, but we this came up when we were talking uh, both later off mic and a little bit in the episode about how we end this episode with Brion and Violet kissing. And they're cute. I ship it. I want to ship it more, but I'm so frustrated by this moment because we've had no real indication from the show that they were really at this point already. Like they have a little bit of casual flirting and one way too casual handhold in this episode. Brion just holds her hand and I'm like, wait, this should be a bigger deal than it is right now, but fine. And that doesn't, for me, lead up naturally to the kiss that we see at the end of this episode, especially when it's compared with the way romantic coding has worked in the rest of the series. The Mm. way that they have... (laughs) This is a whole thing that I could unpack in a 20-minute episode, but basically, to sum up what I mean by that, how a romance is presented in a show and how we as an audience are supposed to react to that depends on the way romance is handled throughout an entire series, throughout an entire movie. If you show me that romance, a couple that is together in a movie franchise, is a couple that holds hands, flirts, kisses, whatever it is, all of that, and then you give me another couple and go, we haven't shown you any of that for these two, but you should root for them. It doesn't work. Because if you have already given us what an arc looks like, and then you give us Mm -hmm. something that skips all of the other points on that arc, but jumps to the last point on that arc... We, we feel cheated <laughs> as an audience. I've had I've seen this in other shows. There was a show, a weird fantasy show I watched a year or so back that the first season set up a whole romantic arc between two characters with them flirting and them staring at each other and pining and all of that teen drama thing had them kiss multiple times throughout the entire season, ki- killed off that romantic interest at the end of that season, gave them a new romantic interest in the next season in which they never interacted romantically until the last episode where they kissed. And they're like, see, they've been in love this whole time. And I'm like, no, you showed me what this character looks like in love. That's not it. And you're trying to tell me that's it, but it doesn't work. So this, so Young Justice has shown us a bunch of different types of relationships. We have had a bunch of different canon relationships throughout the show that they have shown us. This is how we get from point A to point B. And then Brion and Violet, they kind of skip over a lot of those steps. We don't get as much interaction between them as we do from some of the season one chips. So it's harder for me to just accept this kiss as like, oh, yay, they're together now because it doesn't have the same buildup. Yeah, I can see that. My, I'm, I'm running through some things in my head and then I'm actually dismissing them as, as they come up in my head because like, you're you're the romantic expert on the show here, so you are free head, to disagree I'm, with me. No, no, I I don't disagree with you. But but here's and here's the thing though. There's a difference between for me, like there are other things that I I like watch something, a movie or an episode, and yeah. I I know how I feel, and then I go back and analyze how I got to that place where I feel it. Like oh, I felt like this. How did I get here? And that may be good or bad. Like there are show there. There's uh, one movie in particular. Um, that I won't name. That I, while I was watching the movie, I was like, "This is pretty fun. I like this. This isn't. This is cool." But I kept having these problems during the 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 movie, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I walked away from the movie feeling nothing. Yeah, like I felt like I should be really excited about this film, and there's something that's I'm not. Like I didn't take the emotional roller coaster my brain thinks I should have. Yeah, and yeah. I had to sit down and like analyze it. And the more I thought about it, the more I turned out to actually hate this movie. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is now I understand why I kept thinking I was having a, a feeling, but it really wasn't though. Like I kept feeling I should feel this way, and so I guess I'll assume that I'm supposed to feel this way. 
and then didn't. And this is kind of how I feel about the Violet Brown thing. I think it's cute too. Like I'm like with you. I'm like, yeah I'm, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them being together. I think it's okay. It's it's an odd dynamic, like you're saying. Like the mother box has been in this body not very long, and is experiencing these human emotions in a borrowed body, which is interesting and strange. You know, like as well, and it's an ancient alien computer. There's so much interesting stuff to unpack there. Right. Like there could be a whole, like just an art, just a whole season of just their romantic arc really in there because of the complexities, again, of the psychological, the psychospiritual, the, the, the emotional situation between the two of them could be well explained. Now, of course, you only have so much time and it's an ensemble, ca- ensemble cast and that kind of thing. But you're right. They have, I think I, I also walk away with it going like, this seems fast for some reason. And also I'm not as on board as I think I should be. Yes, because part of it is, especially going back and writing the outlines for these episodes, I understand what they're trying to do and how they tried to set it up. And it's like the fact that in the previous episode, uh, we have the whole thing where Dick has his whole speech where he's like, are you a man who's looking to the past or looking towards the future of what you could blah, 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 blah. Right. But that's all framed in the context of Tara. So it doesn't connect until my like 10th rewatch that I'm like, oh, I see how you could interpret that as like him being Brion deciding like, oh, yeah, I should go after what I want in the future. And what I want in the future is Halo. But the fact that I have to rewatch that like 12 times before that clicks as even a possibility of kind of setting that up for me shows that it doesn't quite work. And part of it is also the fact that we don't see the two of them for most of this episode. We see Queen Perdita and Garfield for more of this episode. And yeah. thus we feel kind of on my end, I've more invest I was like, oh, these two are really cute. I like them. They kiss at the end. I'm happy. And then we cut to Brion and Violet. And instead of being like, oh, those two finally got together, my brain is instead going, wait, how did we get here? We don't yeah. know. We don't because we also don't get to see the lead up to that kiss. Because a kiss and the lead up to a kiss are two different things that are both important. Yeah. And what does what does the mother box even understand about any of this human relationship, right? Right. And so does that set up of, and it's just a question, it's not something I, I fully believe, but the question of like, does this set up a strange power dynamic between Brion and her? I don't even know. Even though she is literally thousands and thousands of years old, but this situation is entirely new to her, so... I don't know. There's a lot of, I, I can't put my finger on it and I'm really just thinking out loud. So it's like, you can definitely approach it from that angle. And there is mm-hmm. a way to do this story that approaches it from that angle. There's a way to do this story that approaches it from like a really cute angle of Brion presenting the idea of like asking if he can kiss her and her being like, what do you what, mean? What is, what is that? Mean? What is that? Yeah. What does that mean? And being oh, able to Oh, that's a have, great scene right, right there. That's yeah, a real... that like, would be so cool. Hi, my name's Emily. I like writing genre romance. <laughs> and when you present me with a character who like doesn't understand human interaction, it can be real cute. Uh, yeah. That would be like a real cute thing, but we don't get and that. And it may, it may have happened. We just It may have happened, that. but we don't get to yeah. see that. So we don't know. We just cut to the two of them yeah, kissing in the I woods gotcha. outside the Happy Harbor place. And I'm left going, wait, who kissed who and why? And what is the lead up here? And these things matter and we don't get them here. So for me, this feels less like the right payoff for this episode and more like set up for the next episode. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because there are many, many things about Young Justice that we do not get explanations for, and we're okay with that. But for some reason, like, we enjoy the speculation. Like, we're thinking, like, oh, what happened? I'm curious. I'm interested. But this one is a little bit different in that it's like, okay, we don't know what happened, and I'm actually, I feel like I need to know. I felt like I was wanting, or I was being asked to feel something, and I'm no, I'm asking the wrong question. Yeah. Like we've been talking about like, how do you get your audience to ask the right question? And the right question shouldn't be like, why am I watching this? <laughs> like the question, the question should be like, Ooh, I want to know more. Tell me more. And in this one, I do want to know more, but it's because I feel like I, I need to know more to have the feeling that the writer is asked or the, not just the writer, but like the whole, you know, creative group is, is asking me to have. Yeah. And me who, again, we might get something in the last half where this does not work out as well as we might think, you know, I don't know. But maybe we'll see. like, maybe that's why they're not focusing on it as much. I don't know. We'll find maybe. out. 
But yeah, we'll I wanted, I needed, I need to, to do a little mini super sweethearts canary brief, debrief unpacking of yeah. all that because it's it's been on my mind since we did our scream something. Well, and and it's and it's a thing that I was going to ask you about too because like I see that one scene and the way that it's paced and timed, and I'm just like, oh, that's so cute. But then as I as I think about it, I'm thinking like, okay, I would like, yeah, something's not. I, yeah. It needs more analysis, and I don't have the romantic arc analysis <laughs> ability skills that you have. And I, I love that idea. That, I'm sorry, I'm just I don't want to repeat myself, but like that that scene, the lead in scene, like it's basically how do you how do you do this? Like this is fine. How do you do it to get what you want? If this is what you the scene you want, then that's great. How do you build up to this scene in little bits and pieces to make this as, as impactful as you could potentially make it? It's impactful. But is there a way to make it to maximize that as much as possible? It, people will hear this in the upcoming Ariel Horn discussion. We talked about uh, how the first Super Martian kiss that we get is after a whole episode that is Super Martian heavy that follows on the heels of Bereft, where they almost kiss and don't. So we have that. Targets, where they are being mistaken for a couple and are kind of living with this weird energy of we almost kissed in the desert but then we didn't which then leads into terrors where we unpack some of their stuff with their relationship connor has his moment of revelation and then they kiss and you're like this is a satisfying payoff this feels right if you are a shipper of them i know there are people who didn't ship them who didn't care i shipped them i cared it feels like a satisfying payoff yeah it that and that pattern you just it sounded like it's that rule of three we were talking about right a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, you're right. I don't, I'm not sure if I, I'd have to go back and rewatch the scenes with the two of them, whether I feel like any kind of rule of three was, was happened to be utilized. And rule is loosely used as a rule, but yeah. guideline Or three. even like Spitfire at the end of season one, they kiss at the end with the, because of the New Year's thing. But leading up to that, we have like the moment where they've been on very bad terms for a while, but they were on good terms up to a point. Mm -hmm. have that break and when they come back together they immediately return to like oh we're on good terms and we spend almost a full two episodes with them being a good team working together and having that kind of tension of we were almost at a dating point and haven't talked about it that leads up to the very end of that episode where we get that kiss yeah and i do there were some people that i've that have talked to us that have asked you specifically like how did you <laughs> feel about that because they felt like it came out of left field um, and I could see how someone might feel that way that wasn't looking at the, the breadcrumbs that were being laid. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the more I've rewatched the first season, I'm, I'm seeing all of these things much differently, much more clearly, I think. I have one job and I'm here to do it. Um, <laughs> you have many but jobs. Yeah, this is the one you're that's... real good at. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like this whole thing, cause I remember when you and Neil had first watched the episode and then I saw it. I remember both of you talking to me and were like, oh, you were probably so excited about that that Halo and Brion kiss. And I was like, I wasn't. And yeah. I need to think about it for a while as to why. Uh, <laughs> and these are the conclusions I've come to. And every time you do that, I think, mm, I'm wrong. Mm, I wonder how I'm wrong. <laughs> I can't wait to hear about it. No, how I can change not... my thought process. You're not wrong. Oh, no, not emotionally. No, no, not emotionally wrong. I'm thinking like I'm feeling because I, again, that thing, that first reaction was like, oh, that's really cute. But something's not quite sitting right deep down in me, but I don't know how to analyze it. And that's ex actually exciting to me when someone brings up something <laughs> and shows me like, hey, let me give you a real, real structured idea about a different view of this situation, because then that means that I'm growing and changing and evolving and seeing things in new perspectives that are outside of my perspective. And that's, that's important to me. And it excites me. And in this, in this way, I think both Neil and I both were like, Oh, look, so much kissing. There's a <laughs> lot of kissing. And who are we going to think of Emily? <laughs> so, cause yeah. yes, smoochy moments are important, <laughs> but you got to make them <laughs> emotionally <laughs> resonant for me to think they're important. No, just start kissing. Everyone kiss. <laughs> <laughs> That's not necessarily the solution. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> be the be the expert. <laughs> I'm only the expert in the room. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, but okay. I'm sure well, Neil has all of that. some points. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, Neil. Do you have any have any points from Neil to touch on oh, after yeah. my Several like things. twenty minute <laughs> mini super sweethearts? Y'all get two canary debriefs this week. Yep, he's got he's got several things. The uh, just some nods to obviously the Space Trek thirty sixteen. We've had a number of listeners pointing out to us in um, on Twitter in particular the fact that Star Trek and Space Trek both exist in the same universe because Star Trek was referenced in the tie in comics specifically. Um, so the he's dead Tom um, being a nod to the he's dead Jim classic. Uh, you know the original series of Star Trek Burbank sixteen sixteen. Best time stamp ever, he said. <laughs> he just says Harvey the Clamulon. Just He's a good dude. No, him no and, context. Him and Coffee Pot Guy. Him and Coffee Pot Guy should be friends. That's right. And Neil says, no more crashing the mode. Halo is a mother box. Ding. <laughs> Ding. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the hotel room that they're in, uh, in instead of uh, the Beverly Hills uh, location of the Luther Grand Hotel, not the Metropolis one, as we had discussed in some past episodes, still room 1616. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> Hold on. So, yeah, read that note. Read it again. Read it one more time. And he's right, but... <laughs> I do not get this. You're going to have to, you read this and you break this down for me. So, so this was something I noticed the part of this that is about Doom Patrol Go and had gone, that seems like an odd detail. But what Neil has written, and we will try <laughs> to make sense of, okay, I'm fascinated. is that the thermostat, which I believe he means the thermostat in the Beverly Hills hotel room, is set to 72 degrees. Okay. Which Neil points out is often referred to as the perfect temperature based on science, uh, okay. <laughs> which we have no <laughs> no explanation here beyond that. But it's the same temperature on the thermostat in the background of the Doom Patrol Go segments that you can see behind Elastigirl's shoulder throughout most of the scene. And because I had to what? take note... Yes. Because what? I had to take notes on this episode, I noticed that and my brain kept going... Why is that a 72 instead of a 16? We can't make it a 16 because that's way too cold. And I'm like, they just picked a number. But apparently, according to Neil, they've picked what is scientifically the perfect room temperature. And it's the same temperature on both a thermostat in the real world and a thermostat in his hallucination because his hallucinations are just built on stuff from the real world. What? Hold on one second. Just give me one second. Okay. Sorry, I was checking math on something. Never mind. It didn't work out as interestingly as I thought it might. Did you so, want to see if 72 could be divided by 16? <laughs> no, I wanted to see if Celsius and Fahrenheit turned out to be that it was 16 degrees. <laughs> I did the math. It doesn't work out. Um, we were so hopeful. Nine-fifths plus 32 did not quite work out. Um, man. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> well, and these are the things, too, that, like... Somebody did that. Somebody did yep. that on purpose, and then an yep. and, and storyboarded it and animated it, and like, I, yep. Anyway, yep. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he points out that Connor uses says sphere yep. when sphere is in sphere form, but then Autumn immediately says super cycle once it's transformed in, and when she's transformed, and it's like she has a secret identity, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. Uh, I feel like they yeah. kind of use them interchangeably, but yeah, it was interesting to me that he just switches. It's like he uses her full name. He's like trying to be like, <laughs> yeah. it's like referring to your kid by their full name to try and get their attention and make them listen to you right now. <laughs> uh, Neil says, I still think that Halo is verbally speaking the language of the mother box that would otherwise be a written language. That's interesting. 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 Because it is an interesting detail that she doesn't know she's speaking it. Because Artemis asks what it is yeah. in this episode. And, and like, Halo simply about? responds with, what language? Right, right. He says, I'm, I'm so interested in seeing how the monkey god stuff shapes up. And so do I, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I still wonder if it will be what happens since everything happening in the episode is in his mind. He's, I think he's trying to, you know, is, is it just Garfield rationalizing? 
like why he's limited in these ways or how he manages to do things. But like McGann, I, and we've talked about this, McGann follows rule of conservation of mass. Like she talks about like, oh, I'm deep under the ocean. And so I actually decrease in size because the pressure increases. And, and I'm like, okay, interesting. Like <laughs> there, there are at least nods made to it, but like he goes from like a tiny, he, he turns into tiny things and turns into enormous things that are able to carry weight and mass. Um, and we've mentioned it in the past, but like it's more clear in him than I think it is in McGann because she's usually just shape changing into someone with some extra arms or <laughs> you know what I mean? I and it's know. like because I because I because I was processing this and thinking because she her normal form, her like her white Martian form is bigger, mm -hmm. is significantly bigger than being just a normal person. But. There's it's like some level of like and thinner. We don't know if it's heavier. It's weird. It's like weirdly dis distributed. <laughs> distributed. Yeah, exactly. There it is. Yeah, that's it. nailed it. Yeah. And on some level, I could see that just translating to like McGann in her like humanoid form looks like a normal ish human person, but then like would be way heavier or like would right. be stronger as a result and just kind of right it gets distributed which is weird. which is which is a thing in the comics anyway like they the martians are like kryptonians kind of i mean there's a strength and invulnerability and density control thing yeah. that happens with them so yeah i don't know i don't know we'll see but then meanwhile garfield is like i'm a mouse i'm an elephant it's fine who needs <laughs> conservation right. of mass Right, magic. and it's not like we—it's not like we don't have haven't had magic in the show, but like this interesting cross between the the, the worlds of Doctor Fate and Zatanna, with the quote unquote you know alien sciencey whatever you want to call it with the Martians is fascinating to me, and I I actually really love this idea. Yeah. Um, and if they're going to be in, if they're going to introduce the concepts of the green and the and the red or these energy fields that involve animals and plants and whatnot, so I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how it shapes out. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll wrap all that up. Uh, we'll head into our mid roll. Um, we'll come back with a canary debrief, some fan service, and crash the mood. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid roll. We have a new five star review this time from Mitch Gregg. Lots of Aster. Just as Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti's passion for the source material bleeds through every frame of Young Justice, Rich, Caleb, and Emily's passion for the show beats through every word, giving new insights and fresh lessons on these sidekicks we all love. Thank you, Mitch. Or Greg. I'm not quite sure. Both? Mitch Greg. We'd also like to welcome two new Patreon backers, Acadia Stevens and the Granger Zone. Granger Zone, welcome to Gamma Squad. And Acadia, welcome to Beta. Our most recent rush of squad backers puts us well past our goal for bringing back Elseworlds. For those who may not know, we've already given Whelm-style deep dives to three DC animated features, Batman Under the Red Hood, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, and Justice League New Frontier. Patreon backers will be providing us a list of their favorite DC animated films, and we will be running a poll to choose which of our backers' favorites we'll be featuring in our next Elseworlds. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. <laughs> yeah. Surreal is one of the few words I had to describe Nightmare Monkeys, but I know that technically surreal isn't entirely accurate. So the definition of surreality is a 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature which spot to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind. For example, by the irrational juxtaposition of images. And the Wikipedia states, works of surrealism feature the element of surprise, unexpected juxtapositions, and non sequitur. So, maybe? But when writing an episode like this, surreal isn't exactly accurate if you look at other works of that type. What Nightmare Monkeys has, and needed to have, was a through line. There's a story here. Garfield's story. And though the elements can feel non sequitur, like jumping from the Engager's Bridge into Doom Patrol Go, the art style, the voice intonations, and feel are all shockingly different, but the through line is never left behind. We know what this story is about. Even if the presentation leaves us with as much of an emotional memory of the episode as anything else, particularly after only just one viewing. 
If you want to explore this style of storytelling, please do. For me and many others, surreal twists to themes and ideas can be a deeply emotional and spiritually satisfying experience. You can tell a truly, by definition, surreal story, but if you place a scene like this in the middle of a novel or a comic or TV series with characters that people already know and recognize and understand, I recommend looking to what Greg did here as a guide. Make your through line clear. Know why you're telling this story, even as how you're telling the story becomes a roller coaster. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC Young Justice and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. Uh, this week, I wanted to share a podcast on creative writing. Uh, it brought it up recently in a conversation on Twitter and just realized this is probably a good place for it. Uh, I've been listening to this podcast off and on for well over a decade now. Uh, it's called Writing Excuses. It's a short-form podcast that features authors Mary Robinette Cowell, uh, Brandon Sanderson, Howard Taylor, and Dan Wells. But it often features guests who happen to be experts in the, the subject that they're talking about at the time. The thing that's really interesting, the, the episodes are highly edited and very tightly topic-focused. And they average just 15 minutes. So they're real easy to absorb and they stay on topic, which I think is really impressive considering there's at least three, sometimes four or more people involved in the conversation. But you can think of them as basically longer versions of our really brief canary debriefs. Um, and when you take a look at the podcast, it may look intimidating at first with 14 seasons that have up to 50 episodes per season. <laughs> um, but each of the episodes is titled really clearly with the subject of the day, like breaking down hybrid outlining and discovery writing, or explaining proposals, pitches, and queries in the publishing industry, or talking about raising the stakes in your work, or discussing the similarities and differences between villain, antagonist, and obstacle in your writing. So anyway, you could just run through the titles and find the topic that interests you and absorb it literally on a lunch break. It's, it's great. You can find them at writingexcuses.com or your favorite podcatcher, and we'll have a link to the show in the show notes. All right, let's crash the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen at this time, but not for long. If you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. Um, so, Halo's a mother box. Wait. <laughs> I think we should at least mention it in these last two just for consistency's sake. <laughs> Doesn't need to be here, but it's tradition. Oh, your first note is in all caps, Emily. <laughs> Why is it in all caps? It is. <laughs> it is cuz I can't I can't talk about Dr. Helga Jace with any level of calmness. So this millionth rewatch of this of this episode, there's a moment during Halo's like exposition little montage where Artemis is explaining what she thinks happened uh, to Halo, how Halo would have died and woken up in that grave, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a moment where they just randomly cut away to like Jace reacting. And like, she's the only one who gets like a single reaction shot and all this. <laughs> and like her eyes go wide and she seems like kind of shocked and surprised and confused, but like keeps it contained. And I'm over here just screaming because I don't trust her and I want to, but I can't, I can't doesn't, trust. Doesn't Jace. she say something too? Like, Oh, this is, they gave this to X and to break down. Wasn't it a, a Dr. Professor X. <laughs> oh, yeah, because she, she explains, because Connor's like, they murdered a mother box. And she's like, well, yeah, this is what happened. And she's like, they right. tried to take it apart and figure it out. And it didn't work. And there was a bright flash of light. And then it just went dead. And oh, Connor's so like, her reaction no, to Gabriel it. is after? I think. I think you're right. A lot happens in this episode. I didn't write it <laughs> down okay. all in perfect detail. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, Jace, we don't trust you. Freaking yeah. hairbrush. Ugh, get into the hairbrush. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get yeah, to that next yeah. next episode. Um, you and Neil both mentioned that the good goggles really look like Father Box tech. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah. Seeing it on the side when it lights up and you got those two circles with the yeah. zigzaggy red line between mm -hmm. them. I'm like, ah, oh, Father Box tech right there. <laughs> yeah. And that, that style and design that you see with a lot of the... Uh, 
the new god stuff is all what we uh humorously refer to as kirby tech uh named after jack kirby who created that particular drawing style that shows up and and it's so funny to me that <laughs> that in in justice league unlimited and in here in young justice and other places where you see it like that kirby tech style it's not like a normal style of animation <laughs> at all and people are like oh no we're drawing new gods in kirby tech this is what we're doing this is totally we're making it work you know <laughs> and, it's how it is <laughs> exactly all these unnecessary lines and corners and like all kinds of zigzaggy lines a friend of mine made these great um things you could print out these stickers to put on your iphone to make it look like it was a mother box and my old nice. I, my old iphone used to look like that because basically that's what iphones are now except for yeah. tele- teleportation which would be super handy but like yeah father box has such diverse uses as bringing a child back to life and giving him cybernetic arms or watching an old episode of hello megan that's fair both can be done right exactly <laughs> father box tech the way of the future no it's evil oh neil also mentioned that there's some symbols he said i couldn't place the symbols that flashed when it shows the encino map but it could be more of a clue yeah um, they looked they looked like weird f- the father box mother box language that's like weird lines and shapes and whatnot right. i also realized this time around uh when the brainwashing thing starts happening they show you garfield's eyes and the reflection of what he's seeing on his eyes so you have to pause it and rewind it four times to read everything backwards but from doing that because that's what I use my time for. It says, go need power now, and then gives him the map to Encino. And I have questions about what that means, because that's ominous. That's not just go to this place now. It's, we need power. You are going to supply that power yeah. child that we are taking <laughs> right. for our evil plans. Um, I uh, for those of you who are listening to this one, I have, I'm going to call it next episode. I'm going to be calling back to this episode specifically about this brainwashing with Garfield. So just keep some of these ideas in mind because we'll see how that goes next episode as well. Because something happens then that made me finally go like realize, oh no, yet another thing to be stressed about. Welcome to Whelmed where we're stressed about everything <laughs> what, forever. What was the quote? Welcome to Whelmed where we don't trust anybody. Yeah, yes. basically. But yeah, maybe. I was just going to say that this, on some level, makes me anxious about the uh, the anti-life equation stuff, just because that kind of command feels very anti-life equation-y. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how, because I don't know anything about the anti-life equation other than it's no one bad does. and scary. <laughs> no one does. Uh, it's enigmatic <laughs> and undefined. Yep. So I'm fascinated to see where they go with this. Um, One thing that I had been thinking of, it it doesn't end up being Crash in the Mode, I guess, but I was, I had been thinking like many times I was watching this episode, I was like, oh, okay, so wait, so everybody that's dead in the, in real life dies again on the, on the um, bridge, except for Wally, who keeps talking this whole time. And so I was like, oh my gosh, is this like a nod to the fact that maybe Wally isn't gone? And that kind of, and then I realized, oh, nope, because Jason's still alive. But, but he, Jason died. He did. Oh, you're right. I guess he, as far as and we came know, back. as far as we know, if they do, if they do the Under the Red Hood style story, then Jason was absolutely dead and was fully resurrected by... But we don't know if that's the story that happened. But it makes sense considering he has so much memory loss. So I don't know. Maybe that is a possibility. And if it's just in Gar's head, that's one thing. But if this is a again this uh, deeply like, you know, uh, a, a sh- if this a sh- really if this is, is a, the monkey god, if this is some kind of uh, shamanic spiritual journey that he's going on. Also, one thing I noticed was like right before the thing shorts out, you get the little the little giggly noise with the monkey. Yep. There's a little monkey in there. And at first I was like, oh, is that the digital version of the... And then I realized, no, this monkey showed up in the past, right? This is one of the games where they're chasing around trying to grab a monkey. Yes, but now it's green because uh, but, Beast Boy is green. But it was green in, in the in this one. Oh, I have to look. Yeah, there you go. Interesting. It's a little bit different. But they planted this monkey thing a long time ago to use it now to have the transition work, you know? Yeah. Hi, <sighs> welcome to Will, where we really don't trust anyone or anything. <laughs> 
Yeah. This is why, like, my outline, I don't remember how many of them I took out, but so much of my outline for this episode <laughs> had the word apparently right. thrown in there because I'm like, Seems I don't like... trust any of this because <laughs> right. I'm putting it, I'm like, apparently this is what happens, uh, but a little behind give the it scenes, a few more episodes. A little behind the scenes is, as Emily was writing out the outline for, I think it was this episode, I went in to go look at the early draft outline and she's got a note to herself that just said, Emily, cut these notes down. There's so many of them. <laughs> Rich is calling me out over here. No, it's great because I do the same thing. I'm like, I'm just going to write everything down and I have to come back and edit it later. You know, it's the the right drunk edit sober. You get all the ideas down first and then you go back and look at what, how to, to and this episode is so much I, to the point where I, I literally had paralysis through analysis. <laughs> I, I have Emily's got all of these like relevant notes bullet pointed and I, I literally have what do I have my notes are, <laughs> I have two bullet points the I've had practice crying line and then the second one just says I watched the episode twice over the past 24 hours and am completely can't do anything <laughs> about notes that's my two notes <laughs> we're professionals oh my gosh oh, so much all but right. I think that's it that's I think it we gotta move on okay. to the next one let's get into let's get into let's get into the next episode i won't even i was gonna make a joke but i can't even let's do it (laughs) let's wrap this up and zeta out of the watchtower thank you for spending some time with us if you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series you can find us at twitter at the yj files on facebook at crashing the mode on tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com and at our website crashing the mode.com and if that isn't enough you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com you can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those, so make our job a little easier. (laughs) If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.